and uh, welcome to this home edition of uh, Politics Today, where we will be discussing the impact of cancel culture, not only on our society, but also on Bible-believing Christians. And in this programme today, I'm joined by Tim Diep, who's Head of Policy at uh, Christian Concern, together with uh, David Curtin, who is a London Assembly member but he is also representing the Heritage Party. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, warm welcome to the programme. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll start off with, with you, Tim, because with, uh, with Christian Concern, uh, you're very much on the front line regarding these topics. Um, can you just define for us what is cancel culture as it's dominating our news headlines i mean the latest story today is that ant middleton uh has been axed from channel four um he plays plays the main character in sas who dares wins uh with the reference that he made to black lives matter back in june uh, and now he's been lost from his job and obviously the show will not be the same without him um can you explain to us what cancel culture is yeah, sure. Well, it's exactly that example really um, typifies it very well, Simon, that, um, you know, somebody says something that somebody else deems offensive and um, and this sort of offensiveness, whether they actually prove that someone's really offended by it or not, they, they decide that somebody might find that offensive and then they decide that is beyond the pale. We can't tolerate this. And the person loses their job, loses their position, loses their, their opportunity to share on Facebook or Twitter or other platforms and is kind of cancelled in some way and it and it happens it's happened quite a lot another but another aspect of it apart from people losing their jobs and we've uh, Chris Christian defended a number of Christians who've lose, lost their jobs over posting things on Facebook or expressing things in some way or other um, another aspect of it is the whole aspect of people um, being prevented from being you know being prevented from saying what they really think and uh, feeling like we can't really say what we think and we have to be careful about this. We have to be cautious about what we say and stuff. And I've been struck reading about how that is similar to how people felt under uh, communist Russia. Uh, they felt, you know, you know, afraid to say what they really think and, and were, were cautious about everything they say. And I feel like that's what our culture is in now. People feel, gosh, I better not say what I really think here in case this person might do something or report me or get offended or whatever it might be. And this is, this is a symptom ultimately of cancel culture it tries to say only these things are politically acceptable to say and these other things are not politically acceptable to say and therefore if you if you stray over the line of what's politically acceptable to say um then you're going to be cancelled we're going to jump on you there's going to be a mob that attacks you um and this kind of thing going on and um david uh, you're in the front line in uh, british politics by being a member of the london assembly and i can't imagine that is an easy place to be a bible believing christian um can you share with us um how you've encountered uh, this uh, council culture within the london assembly yeah well you you're right it's a very very difficult place to be a christian it's a very very difficult place to have you know traditional views or conservative views i mean i'm not, I'm not talking about what i would call the fake conservative party anymore but um you know just standing up for traditional family values and these kind of things when i do that in the london assembly i have one member after another after another clapping each other for condemning me for taking those kind of stances you know for for christian values but another example of when um i was i wasn't cancelled in the sense that I was thrown out of the chamber, but I was cancelled in the sense that um, my questions were stopped when I asked the mayor, who's currently Sadiq Khan, about grooming gangs in London, and he really didn't like the question. He got very defensive. I tried to carry on questioning, and the chair um, then interrupted me and said, oh, I should be uh, not taking that line of questioning and then um, ended my, my time and then moved on to the next person. So in a sense, I, my, my line of questioning was cancelled. Um, but I have had um, other people in, in the chamber who actually stand up and saying, I'm looking forward to seeing you not get elected next time and seeing the end of you and your group and your party in this assembly. Well, I hope that when the next elections come up on the 6th of May, um, I will be there 
and then they won't be. So we'll see what happens. But you know, I know it's like walking into a bear pit, and um, you, you know, you're faced with all these people who who really don't like you standing up for you know just just what I would say a common sense traditional or Christian values, and um, uh, yeah, they want to cancel me. So we yeah. pray that uh, they won't cancel you and, uh, you know, that uh, you will actually increase your majority and uh, get elected back to the uh, London Assembly and the new, new party, the uh, Heritage Party. And, uh, yeah, that will give them something to worry about. Um, Tim, Simon, another aspect yeah, go, go. of this is, go, uh, go for it. is at universities, of course, as well, yes. um, where you've had a lot of no platforming of speakers. Um, because student unions have objected or campaigned and said this person's views are unacceptable, this person's views shouldn't be tolerated, whatever it is. And so various people have been cancelled um, at universities, I mean, both Christians and non-Christians as well, um, and, and prevented from speaking and prevented from um, debating um, in universities. And I think that's a real concern um, because obviously that's where people learn, you know, through talking, through debating, through discussing things. And if, if students are not allowed to discuss some things, not allowed to um, promote some ideas, then their education is being devalued. And there's even been cases of people, I mean, we defended a student, Felix Nagole, who was expelled from university for posting on Facebook, you know, he was thrown off the course, Sheffield University, for posting on Facebook about uh, family values. And, um, and we've also defended an academic freedom case of somebody who wanted to do uh, non-politically correct research. Um, so this is a real issue as universities are threatened with this and of course the good news is that the government has announced that they're going to bring in a free speech champion and they're going to put a duty to promote free speech on universities and hopefully this will help. I mean another aspect of this of course is pro-life societies at universities and student unions have often wanted to cancel them or say you can't be a member of the student union because of your views, you're promoting views that we don't like and they try and cancel them and we've been able to defend many student pro-life societies around this but if they have a stronger duty to protect free speech this should help these cases and it should protect academic freedom and protect students who are being threatened you know because they've expressed views and this kind of thing then you know so it's this is a it in some in some ways it's concerning the government's recognize a real problem here there is a real problem but the good news is they're they're now moving to enforce a sort of duty of free speech on universities on student unions as well so they can't do no platforming. They have to abide by these things. They can't just cancel people over expressing particular views. And I hope that this really works. We've yet to see the detail of it, but I hope it really works. And I think it could be a model that extends into other areas too. But they're right to start with universities because that's absolutely key. You've got to have freedom of speech and freedom of debate in universities where people are studying and learning things. And um, David, as a, as a politician or as an elected politician to the London uh, uh, Assembly, how vital is freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and also mm. academic thought uh, within your work when you look at some of the uh, policy announcements made by the Mayor of London and in his administration on the impact that this may have on, on Londoners? How vital is this for you to do your job? Yeah, well, it's, it's absolutely vital. I mean, not just for London, but for the whole country to have freedom of speech so that people can express their views. And, you know, if we don't have that, then people, you know, are almost prisoners in their own mind and, and, and can't say what they want to think. I mean, in London specifically, I mean, the London mayor has jurisdiction over police and crime in London because he's actually essentially also the police and crime commissioner. So what um, the current mayor has done is open up something called an online hate crime hub which is one of these units which is there to police people's thoughts on the internet and people's posts on social media and I've said many times you know, the job of the police is to catch real criminals to catch murderers and, and thugs and vandals and burglars that's what the police should be doing they shouldn't be trolling the internet for people's opinions and arresting people or charging people for having um, politically incorrect thoughts you know for, for particularly you know for standing up for traditional family values and things like that and um, you know this is a problem in London it's a problem all over the country as well and with the whole burgeoning concept of hate crime and hate speech um, there's now a classification that the police um, uh, collect uh, data on which is called non-crime hate incidents so if you do something that isn't a crime 
but someone feels that you've said something that's offensive or has offended them, then they can report you to the police, the police record it, they make a, you know, you get some kind of um, record uh, in the police database, but you haven't committed a crime. You've just said something that's perfectly legal that someone thinks is politically incorrect. And you had the case um, in Humberside of a gentleman who, who made a limerick about something and uh, he, the, the police came to his house and, and said, we need to check your thinking on this. And obviously he'd done nothing wrong, but it's got recorded as a non-crime hate incident. And there's, you know, th this is just absolutely ridiculous waste of police time and police money, and it's uh, eroding our freedom. And um, uh, Tim, I mean, in, in previous decades, uh, we had uh, political discourse, we had those that uh, that we disagreed with, but uh, essentially what uh, we got taught at uh, university was not necessarily to embrace someone else's opinion, but accept that someone has an alternative view. And as part of our, our, our democratic traditions, that they are entitled to hold that view, um, unless it is a, an extreme view that would either lead to violence or would actually lead to a great harm. N now, anyone, it seems, um, can come under the radar, a radar of the uh, cancel culture uh, and particularly Bible believing Christians. Uh, when, when did this all start to, uh, uh, to break down this consensus in a democracy that we can have difference of opinion, um, but we can still get on? Well, I think that um, it, you know, there's been a move uh, around this for quite a long time, really. And I think you know, political correctness started to become a thing, what, 20, 30 years ago, maybe? Yeah, where people started to say some things are politically correct and other things are not politically correct. So it's really grown out of that. And the, the natural extension of political correctness is to say some things are beyond the pale and can't be spoken and, and can't be said. And, um, and it's, a, it's a real issue because it's become widely accepted in society, sadly, um, that some things can't be said or shouldn't be said, or they're too offensive to be said or something like that. So another aspect of this, of course, is street preachers, um, which we are very often defending and have defended multiple um, street preachers for preaching the gospel. Um, and what tends to happen is, is they say things that other people might find offensive, like um, you know, some things are sinful or something like that. Um, and, um, and the police will uh, come and arrest them and say, you know, you've committed an offence here. And they end up in court and we say, hang on a minute, there's no offence of actually offending people. And they end up, so we've got a 100% track record of getting street preachers off um, when they're arrested in this kind of way. Um, but the real problem is that the police attitude, and I don't know if you saw this police poster that um, went up, mm -hmm. was it a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. um, that said, um, being offensive is an offence. And it was a, a massive banner that, you know, that the police were advertising saying being offensive is an, is an offence. Now, that's actually a lie. It's a false statement, right? You, you know, it's not an offence to offend somebody. Mm. You know, otherwise, you know, I can't even say that two plus two is five because somebody might say my child got that answer for and you're upsetting them. You know, you've offended them. You know, you know it's crazy to say that, uh, you know, just being offensive. And, uh, you know, fortunately, there was a massive backlash on social media and the police force had to apologise. But in some ways, apology is not enough because they've promoted a false idea of what the law is and what the law says. They've they've lied about what their what their job is. You know, isn't there a massive retraining exercise that is needed for the police here to say, no, 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 no. Being offensive is not an offence. You need to arrest the people who are threatening the street preachers, not the street preachers themselves, because they've not done anything wrong. It's people who might be threatening them that the people need to be arrested, not the street preachers. And the police need to have a training exercise to show this is not right and it's false and you know the whole Harry Miller case as well which David Kirsten uh, spoke about and has got further to go in the courts you know shows that there's massive police overreach in this and people you know police feel they can arrest somebody because somebody else has been offended well that's just not right. Uh, and David how much would you say that uh, big tech the uh, big internet giants like Facebook, uh, kind of Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, and, and Google are essentially being enablers of this council mm. culture because they uh, fit into what we can only describe as an extreme liberal progressive mm -hmm. viewpoint. 
that is that is uh, contrary to that of a conservative held view, or or particularly those who like us are uh, hold uh, to a biblical uh, standpoint. Um, how are they enabling this uh, council culture? Yeah, it started recently, uh, more recently than the beginning. I think it, when, when these um, social media companies and platforms first started, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they were places where everyone thought, this is great, I can be free to say whatever I want. But then you had no platforming in the universities and physical spaces. But more and more recently, it's gone online. And, you know, you've seen that with the, the, the example that everybody knows about is that President Trump was uh, kicked off Twitter um, you know, in January because um, the, the, the media giants um, thought that they didn't want him on there. And um, you know, now we're getting more and more people uh, thrown off social media, getting banned and so on for having the wrong opinions on a variety of different issues. I mean, I was uh, given a Facebook ban <laughs> once um, for, for having the, the wrong opinions on you know, traditional values and, and so so on. So, um, and then with the whole Black Lives Matter issue, there's been many people who are deemed to have the wrong opinions who have been um, thrown off and, and given bans. And, and now, also with the lockdowns, there's people who disagree with government policy on lockdowns and vaccinations. I mean, I think everybody should be allowed to say what they want on those things. Everyone should be able to have a different opinion and discuss and debate those things freely. But it seems that if you've got the wrong opinions, people are being um, they're having YouTube videos taken down and things like this. And that's happened to a lot of people that I know, um, you know, very, very recently as well. So it's a growing, growing issue. And I think you, now you've got some of the uh, governments, you know, especially the new administration in the United States, tying up uh, and working alongside the big tech platforms in order to try to censor speech, um, which doesn't go along with the government line. So you've got a very, very worrying now amalgamation of big government and big tech working together to censor opinions that uh, they don't like. So um, that, that isn't going to end well unless we rise up and demand that we continue to have free speech. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and Tim, talking about the uh, new administration in the States, uh, Joe Biden uh, and his administration, um, isn't there a great danger that many within his party, the Democrats, are wanting to adopt the Chinese social credit system? Uh, whereby uh, people are given privileges if they if they say a nice comment about the uh, the president of China and their regime, but if they if they start to fight against the uh, the regime in China, then uh, they are given extremely bad housing. They are essentially put in a digital and physical ghetto, uh, whereby they are excluded from top jobs. Um, all because they won't conform. Um, isn't there a great danger that unless we really confront this counterculture uh, here in Britain and in the West, um, the West is only going to follow China's lead and adopt this horrendous uh, social credit system? Yeah, well, I mean, that is the natural extension of where this goes, that um, ultimately you end up sort of, you know, monitoring people more and more and, and, and checking what they're doing and checking who they're meeting and this kind of thing. And that is that does happen in some places in China. And if you if you end up meeting somebody who they don't like, they, that, that counts as negative credit against you and this kind of thing, and it's, it's horrific. I really hope that doesn't happen in America. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not, not comfortable with the direction of travel there, but there we are, I really hope it doesn't happen in America. And I really hope it doesn't happen here. But, you know, what's shocking is the extent to which some of the proposals, like the Law Commission here in the UK, um, yeah, Hate Commission uh, report and, and, and proposals, um, it included things like, you know, you could be criminalized for things you say in your own home, you know, which, which, which meant that you know, your son or daughter could accidentally or on purpose report you to the school for saying, expounding traditional values or something that other people might find offensive. And, um, and you know, you, the police would knock on your house saying, did you say this at the dinner table um, in your house? You know? and, and, and some of the other proposals from the Law Commission on Hate speech are very concerning about you know they, they clearly want to control speech and then you know the other thing that's that's come out today is the extremism commission which is proposing a, a much wider definition of what counts as hateful extremist speech and um, the problem is these things are very difficult to define you know you, you sort of define it quite well Simon of threats of violence and that kind of thing 
um, but they want to define it more broadly than that to things that that people might sense as being inciting hatred or something like that. It's very perception based and it's very difficult. And then in Scotland, you've got the hate crime bill going through there and there's been a massive debate about that, lots of amendments trying to you know, make it less onerous. But the proposal was to make it you know, very, very tight in terms of what counts as hate speech and, um, and lots of you know, even ability to criticize other religions and things could have been criminalized and so on in there and I, I think it's still very much a situation in flux there as we speak as to what how that bill ends up but the scary thing is that the proposals coming from these groups you know scottish government hate commission um the the, the, the commission sorry and the law commission are very concerning in terms of direction of travel they want to move to policing more speech rather than allowing more free speech and um, David, uh, Lawrence Fox, uh, the actor, has created his own uh, political party, and this is a quote that he's, uh, he's made. He says that uh, we won the battle for Brexit. Now we must uh, win the battle for free speech uh, in Britain. So really my question is, um, how do we counter this uh, council culture? Um, because if we don't confront it soon then we're heading towards a, a totalitarian state very, very quickly. Yeah, well, I would agree exactly with that sentiment. I mean, th th this is really a big battle. And I've been speaking about this for years, you know, before we actually got Brexit finally, you know, I was speaking about the whole concept of cultural Marxism, which is then, you know, underpins the sort of ideology that underpins <laughs> the erosion of free speech and political correctness. But we do have to um, speak out and individual people have to stick their heads above the parapet and start speaking out and saying, you know, I don't agree with this this is common sense this is what is reality i i reject your um politically correct opinions your you, you know the ideology of, of blm and, and and things like this people who are against traditional family values and start up for those things but you know what i'm trying to do in the political sphere is create a, a political party that actually does stand for traditional values and liberty and freedom of speech and so the the mix of the two things together i think is very very powerful and a lot of people are coming to join us now from people who have never ever been involved in politics before you know when I'm speaking to people all over the country regularly uh, you know who have just fed up and they really do see the threat um, of what's going on and want to get involved and want to make a change and you see what whatever color of party is the old parties are all sort of working together some want to erode our freedoms quickly some will do it slowly and pretend they're the good guys but you know really they're all going in the same direction you know we've got more and more laws and concepts and and policing uh, strategies are being brought in to, to undermine our freedom so so um, people just need to know how to fight it. That's the thing. There's so many people um, outside London, inside London as well. I talk to people inside London who, who hate it and you hate how London uh, has gone in the last four years. But, but outside London especially, um, people just want government to, to leave them alone, stop trying to micromanage their lives, stop telling them how to think and what to speak and let everyone just get on with their lives. Um, as, as we did in the past. Um, so people need and want uh, to get involved in doing that. So I think if we can all get together, you know, politically, legally, and also perhaps with, with big demonstrations about this on the street as well, you know, those three things together uh, will, um, you know, defend our freedoms and restore our freedoms so that that's my hope and i, I certainly do believe that uh, we can do this if everybody works together to, to make it happen uh, and tim one of the big obstacles we face isn't it in uh, pushing back this uh, council culture is the fact that these extreme uh, liberal progressives um, have influence within social media they have influence within the kind of mainstream media and, and effectively, they're able to demonize uh, born again believers for holding to biblical values. Now, in the past, you could have a difference of opinion, um, but in today's age, you can't. And we know the consequences if this continues, that we'll end up uh, living under an authoritarian regime. Um, and that's why each generation 
has a duty to fight and defend the liberties and the freedoms that the previous generation won for us. And so this is our fight in our generation. Uh, what are your thoughts with uh, two and a half minutes to go? Yeah, no, I think you're actually right. It is, it is our fight and, and freedom's not fought for, our freedom is forfeited is the sort of uh, phrase that, that I always sort of resonates with me about these sort of things. You know, we, we take our freedoms for granted too much and they are very valuable and they are important to stand up for. And, and one thing to mention in this is the Free Speech Union, uh, which was formed about a year ago and which has done great work in defending free speech. They've, they've spoken out in favour of some of our Chris concerns cases and passed some cases over to us as well and they're standing up for free speech and making a difference and pressuring the government and pressuring other organizations they even got uh, facebook to reinstate somebody the other day um, and so on so there are pushbacks happening here there are different groups coming and pushing back and um, and supporting this whole thing and recognizing the importance of it and like i said the government um, imposing free speech duty on universities is a, is a welcome step forward as well so there is some step forward there are some things to welcome it's still a big battle it's still something to defend it's still something to fight for the importance of free speech the importance of being able to say what you think without fear or favor and allowing other people to say what they think um, and respectfully disagreeing is vital to a democratic society because um, democracy can't survive without that bedrock of people being able to say and express and debate and discuss what they think uh, and David, we've got to about a minute and a half. So with, within a minute, um, if this council culture continues, we could see that politicians being silenced, uh, journalists are being gagged, and only one viewpoint would be acceptable. And this will be this extreme mm. progressive liberal viewpoint. Um, and how, in the name of tolerance, does that enhance democratic freedoms? Yeah, well, it doesn't. And, and uh, you know, the tolerance has become intolerance. And that's what we see from the liberal metropolitan elite. And um, but we do see a pushback and we do see people actually now going around it. There are social media platforms which do have freedom of speech. And, you know, I've started a new political party, uh, as Edward Edmund Burke said, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing and you know we really are at the point where good men and women have to choose it's not easy to stick your head up um, and get shot at but we got to do that you know and and we're not yet at the point where we're going to lose our lives we might get kicked off a platform they're now trying to take away our finances and our jobs but you know we, we can support each other but if we don't do it now worse is to come uh, David and uh, Tim, thank you so much for being my uh, guests on this home edition of uh, Politics Today. And I want to thank you for watching this program. Um, all of us have a duty to stand up for our democratic freedoms, and that's uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of expression, and also academic freedom. Because if we don't, we know authoritarianism is just around the corner. And we know as Bible believing Christians that we're out of sync with this new progressive culture. And this makes it more important that we stand on our biblical platforms to defend not only Christian liberty, but liberty itself. So thank you for watching Politics thank Today. You,